E41 Marketplace Ministries. It's all about your business and it's all about our father's business. It's ministry outside the box. No matter what your role is in the business world, E41 Ministries is a special place where we can walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called, just as Ephesians 4.1 commands us. In today's busy and frenetic world, it's a blessing to know that God has a plan to bring hope, comfort, and peace through Marketplace Ministry. The E41 Marketplace Ministry of the Fellowship, it's a kingdom building business. I'm Kerry Fink, and together with Dave Robinson, we're here for E41 Marketplace Fellowship. And we're so excited today to have the opportunity to sit with both Paul Rossberry and Sam Townsend, who are joining us. Welcome, guys. Good to see you. It's good to be here. Good to see you. Kerry. And for those of you who may not be familiar with E41 Marketplace Fellowship, it's an outreach that really is part of the Fellowship of Dallas, Texas, as a ministry to help link together what we learn in the pulpit on Sunday mornings to the marketplace effectiveness of what we go and live with Monday through Saturday the rest of the week. And as typically can be, there's often a big disconnect between those two. And what E41 Marketplace Fellowship is really about helping all of us bridge that gap so we can maximize our effectiveness for the kingdom. And Dave, did, does that sound like a good way to introduce it or help us get some sense of perspective of the fellowship and how E41 Marketplace came to be? For 50 years, the fellowship operated primarily as an organization just for church leaders. But because it was designed not to be an ecclesiastical organization, but a pure fellowship, then several years ago, we started talking about how we can incorporate non-ordained marketplace leaders as part of the fellowship. And so after several years of discussion, it was decided that we needed to do that because the church needs to be effective in extending the kingdom through marketplace calling just as much as through those called to the church who are there to equip them to fulfill their calling in the marketplace. So we actually have a category now where you can be a marketplace minister, and out of that has come this fellowship where we want to be a support uh, to those who work both in the marketplace and in the church world and how to build a bridge between the two. And this is really actually about, uh, I guess, amplifying the effectiveness, meaning that when we talk about having uh, a pastor who's, uh, you know, maybe it's a pastor in the church staff and they have their job and their calling, and then they're preaching and, and doing what they can to build the church on Sunday, and they're preaching to a congregation who then goes back Monday through Saturday into the workplace, but maybe if we can link those two together, then we're really going to increase the impact because now, whereas the pastor may be talking to hundreds or perhaps thousands weekly, now that message can be amplified by two thousands or ten thousands weekly. But one of the complicated things that happens to us in our politically correct world is we go out into marketplace where we can't always, in our politically correct world, necessarily have the right opportunity to bring to bring that message to its to its fullest potential. So one of the things that we do as E41 Marketplace uh, Fellowship is to create this opportunity for people to come together and work on just the just that level to to really uh, focus in and and share how we do things in the marketplace and to make that more effective. So our guest today is Paul Rossberry and Sam Townsend, who are both have significant uh, experience both in ministry and in the marketplace, and I think it's going to be a fascinating discussion. Paul, I'm going to start with you just to have you give us your uh, basic uh, background and the work that you're doing here in the Florida community. Well, uh, I've been in the ministry, uh, full-time ministry, a little over 30 years. I was ordained 25 years ago. And uh, I've always worked outside the four walls of the church. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of times they wouldn't even let me in. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the, what I found significant in the community, I've worked in the business community at the same time, so I've been bivocational as we go along. And a lot of times people reject in the business community uh, a person who has a spiritual life or a Christian life. So it's, it's a challenge for them to overcome. Um, because they want to keep this separation. So when we look at the barriers that are, are in the business community, uh, there's significant issues. 
so over the years, I've actually worked alongside business people and helped develop businesses, but really trying to keep a um, biblical foundation, if you will, when we started the business. Uh, so I've started several organizations. I'm president and spiritual director of Seminary Company Community, which is a uh, national and international organization that empowers people to do the work that God's called them to do. Uh, secondly, uh, I'm currently pastoring at a local church, and uh, we are actually changing the church model to not to be a church of the four walls, but a church that is into the community. And so it's, it's a challenge to get people out of their comfort zone. Uh, and the third thing that I do is called Learn, Start, Build. Learn, Start, Build is an organization that basically is trying to teach business people how to disciple business people in the business community, but using biblical principles. So it's pretty exciting, all the things that are going on. Uh, with Learn, Start, Build, we want to build success clubs. Well, we know that without Jesus, we're really never going to be successful and if we use the biblical principles that are taught from Scripture, then we can do that. Uh, it actually works out very well. I belonged to an organization at one time called the International Christian Chamber of Commerce, and they had developed a curriculum that they took into China to teach them uh, basically you know, how to empower them to be in business. And you see what the result is, is that their economic whole growth has grown, and it, they've used the biblical principles, but they were not allowed to to reference scripture. So in our country, uh, it's got to be kind of a blend of how we teach them, how we disciple them, and how they put those principles into practice into the commerce, into the economic development areas. So the church really doesn't have as much impact into the business community, at least here in Florida, as it used to. We used to have full gospel businessmen and and a lot of different business uh, things. Even some of the larger churches here have started some business luncheons and so on. But it's still not impacting the business community, helping them to see how that we are a company that actually develops small business. So our economic development base is deteriorating because the small business guy is being, um, I don't want to say oppressed, but not fighting against or raising up the principles that are taught in the Bible to, to be in business. So that, that kind of gives you a snapshot where I'm at. So you can we can discuss a lot of that. And well, I think that's the whole idea of E41 Marketplace Fellowship is to uh, present a forum and an opportunity for us to exchange ideas and things like that that will will help <clears throat> specifically. This is part of what uh, Dave has, has uh, focused his attention. His, uh, his background is with coaching for ministers where he actually works with pastors and he talks to them about really uh, tapping into the resources that, they, that people have in terms of the congregation. And so we're going to dig more into that. I want to also introduce uh, Sam Townsend. Sam and I have collaborated on a number of projects and and Prepared Always is, is probably a key project, although he's also known for being Wholeness Ministries and uh, a number of other uh, successful endeavors, including, uh, I guess, first of all, your background as a Wharton-trained MBA, and, uh, and you call yourself a recovering banker. So why don't I let you kind of introduce <laughs> yourself and explain how you've come from that world to, uh, to this world and, and the journey along the way. Absolutely. I uh, started out in the, in the secular marketplace, uh, and uh, came up the lending side, the banking business, uh, been president of several banks, uh, gone off into the wild world of turnaround situations and troubled community banks and so forth. And uh, I've always had a sort of a concern for the underdog and also trying to figure out what the problems are and how to solve them. And uh, that, that was a target rich environment. <laughs> but we're getting back into a really target rich environment now. And uh, I remember, uh, uh, Bruce Wilkinson, who I consider sort of the patron saint of the Fellowship of Companies for Christ, spoke to a meeting we had 25 or 30 years ago. And he said, if revivals to come, it's got to come out of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And his reasoning for that uh, was that um, it's, a, it's a world of cause and effect. If you do something, it's going to be noticed. If it works, it'll be received. If it doesn't, it doesn't. And uh, we live in a time when uh, God has become or is viewed as not viewed at all, it's considered invisible, even irrelevant. To a great extent, uh, the, uh, the visible church has become irrelevant in many respects in the marketplace. 
And uh, the challenge is, is how to get, how to get the, the, the church uh, uh, aware of the opportunities and challenges in the marketplace and to go out into it. Christ and his disciples went to the marketplace and showed, so should we, not hiding within the four walls as, as Paul has said. And uh, so that's really my, been my passion, uh, uh, marketplace ministry, since probably the late 70s. Uh, when I got got serious with the Lord. So not only do I, with one eye, kind of keep track on what's going on in the world and, and why it works and why it doesn't work, and uh, but also uh, holding it all up against uh, up against God's word and uh, in terms of what the model is. It's a lot easier to focus on uh, the, the truth and then identify error than, than try to catalog error because it seems limitless. Yeah. And we're surrounded by it now. One of the things uh, prepared always uh, means uh, abundant living in harm's way. It's something we're used to doing every mm-hmm. single day. We are living in, in a time that is, is complicated. And particularly one of the things that I think is a salient point, and I think this is where I want to bring you in to get your perspective on this, is uh, a thing that Sam has often said is that all life is lived locally. You know, we hear about all these different threats or different things or different things that are impacting us, but yet at the real end of the day, we're really working with the people next to us and getting to know our neighbors. And so even when we're talking about how this works into the marketplace, this even even basically just justifies the whole discussion even further, I think. So Dave, as it, you know, as you travel the world and you're talking to different business leaders and church leaders, how can we how can we best that's the whole point is but how can we best start to make those kind of inroads there are three entities that control every local community every region every state and every nation and that is the business community that pays for everything governments don't make money churches don't make money colleges universities don't make money god has gifted people according to genesis 8 he's gifted some to create wealth and to get wealth. The other ones are the government that passes the laws and regulations that control the society. And then the educational institutions, especially at the university level, that determine the values and philosophies of every generation. So the government leaders and the business leaders who are in power now, most of them have been taught by educational leaders with a very secular humanistic philosophy for the last two generations at least. The secular humanist doctrinal statement was written in 1933 called this uh, Humanist Manifesto. If you read it, you will clearly see what is driving the unbelievers today that control the business community and the governments around the world. I see it not just in America, but I see it all over the world. The church's challenge is how do we send not secular-minded people, but full-time gospel ministers into those three entities? You have to infiltrate and bring real value to the marketplace, which gives you then a platform, and then allow God's favor to elevate you till you get to the place of influence. The E41, and I think we forgot to mention that, actually comes from Ephesians 4.1 which says, walk worthy in the vocation wherein you are called. Every Christian has that calling. A few verses later, in 11 through 15, he instructs the church leaders because he gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists to equip the saints. What saints? The Ephesians 4, 1 saints, for the work of the ministry. So if every believer has a calling, and the church leader's assignment is to equip them for their ministry, then everyone has a full-time ministry calling. I'll share one little quick story. I was in Dallas a few years ago uh, waiting on a plane, and there was a Delta Airline pilot there waiting to get on his plane. He said, Dave, he said, I have my 30 years in. I'm going to be able to retire next year and go into (coughs) full-time ministry. I said, what, did you just get saved? He said, no, I've been saved for 35 years. I said, well, what have you been doing then? He said, well, I've been, I have this secular job flying airplanes. I said, now I'm really puzzled. How does a Christian have a secular job to begin with if we understand the priesthood of all believers? That everything I touch 
as a priest, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, says, I am a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. When I touch it, it's no longer sacred. It becomes a holy sacrifice unto God. I said, I'd be very careful holding up a secular job to a holy God if I were you. And so part of what the Ephesians 4.1 fellowship is about is helping marketplace leaders understand they have a real calling, they have a full-time ministry, and then we have to educate the church leaders to help them understand that and affirm that calling, mm. which will not diminish their calling, but will greatly leverage everybody's calling. It's actually our platform. That's our platform, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, if we go back to go back farther in Genesis, where we find out what God's design and model was in the first place, and since we've gotten away from that, we've got problems. And you can look at any aspect of modern society. Absolutely. You can address it from the standpoint of how did God design it to function? Where's the error? And then, most importantly, how do we get back? How do we get back yep. uh, to tracking with God and making it work? And uh, right now, uh, the uh, that's that's I think where that's where the institutional church needs to really engage with the marketplace, and uh, and and it's, it's going to require some education because there's a lot of scripture. The Bible talks more about wealth and how to how to make it and, and thrive than it does any other subject in the redemptive plan of God. And uh, yet, uh, on Sunday mornings, you don't hear much about that. You really have to kind of take them by the hand, go out there and show up. But that, but that process too often doesn't take place. I actually think that uh, uh, there's two, two issues uh, with regard to getting the churches. The first thing is, is most pastors are very territorial. I don't know if anybody's ever noticed that. It goes with their gift. That's their gift. It's, these are people who have given to me and so on like that. And to... And, and most of the people in the churches are business people or people who are functioning in a, in, a, in a career path. And, of course, what I've been teaching for years is that, you know, this is what God created. He gave you these gifts. So that purpose and vision of what God has given them is probably more empowering. Uh, even people who have taken a job but basically have forgotten what God gifted them for in the first place. And so I, I see that this is another educational issue, uh, not only for people in the church, but for the business community as well. But I see most of the churches, when they gather business people together, it's all about, well, let's study the scriptures and so on like that. And we hope that the scriptures will inspire them instead of the leadership inspiring them with the scriptures. And, and so I see the challenge of, turning that around where we can inspire the people with the scriptures rather than hoping that the scriptures will inspire them. And I think that might be one of the challenges that you have with B41. Well, you know, the, the, the church never had that division until about 325 AD. Mm -hmm. And Constantine, when he became emperor of Rome, finally decided, I can't defeat the church, so I'm going to join it. And he's the one that started the separation. He started buying off influential church leaders with huge tracts of land, building them huge mm -hmm. cathedrals all across Beneficial. Europe. And he started the separation between clergy and laity. And uh, it's been all downhill since then. And so when the two managing gifts of the five gifts in Ephesians 4 got in power, then the pastor teacher, the managers, they had to relieve the pressure that the gifts of the apostolic and prophetic bring to create the healthy tension between the two sets of gifts. And so the managers decided to dispensationalize the apostolic and prophetic through their gift of teaching. And so that was the way those two gifts were eliminated. Mm -hmm. And now here we are 1,700 years later, we're losing in the marketplace. And unless we get those back in the place of leadership, it's not going to happen, as you said. Well, of course, the empires are collapsing now simply through sure. economics. But actually, their economic solutions the church being more effectively involved Absolutely. in the place, and they still have a perceived spiritual authority, uh, which 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 can be useful uh, in uh, in in, uh, in mentoring and and, uh, and developing. Uh, the, the yeah. I, I noticed that uh, a little byline on your book is at the eleventh hour, and Sam and I had some discussions with with that regard. The eleventh hour of uh, you know the church. A lot of people feel that the church is becoming irrelevant. 
and even government is now taking over and controlling uh, things. And uh, I, I always throw this su supposition out. Suppose we didn't have any money. You know, the dollar was gone away. Again, all of the different uh, monies. Well, we would develop something else as money, but it would come up with a different foundation. And if we as um, the, the church, the active church that's here today, can influence the the generations that are basically unchurched. Uh, I just did some statistics here in Brevard County, where we're at. And <clears throat> we have 354,000 people that are not claimed by any religious organization. That's 54% of the population. Uh, 198,000 people here are claimed by some religious organization. However, if you look at the actual attendance of churches, we're less than 100,000 people on, a, on any given Sunday, okay? So that's 450,000 people that are basically out there, business people and other people that are just ripe to the harvest. I mean, we're, we're looking at, you know, there, there's the field. So if we can capture the leadership that is open to discipling and training other people, how they can overcome this, I believe that the church can impact the, the community yeah. that way. You might be surprised about the maturity and the faith of some of those 450,000 that aren't showing up. Yeah, at, at, I heard that you were one. Sense. No, no. <laughs> well, I try to work both sides of the street. <laughs> one of the things that I thought was hilarious was Paul was telling me the story the other day. He walked up to somebody in McDonald's and asked them which church they belong to. And you have to, you have to carry the rest of the story out. Well, actually, I was in, in uh, McDonald's having a coffee with a friend, and these four guys come in, kind of friendly. And so uh, I, we chatted just for a minute as they were going by, and then they went and sat, got their coffee, and had their breakfast. And then when we were done, I went over to them. I said, uh, you, you guys seem really friendly guys. I said, uh, what, what church are you a part of? And they said, well, you know, we're not part of any church. I said, well, you are now. I said, I'm your pastor. Here's my card. If you need me, call me anytime you need. And... Uh, it was kind of like, oh, really? It was, it was kind of, it wasn't a rejection, mm -hmm. but it was kind of like a relief I saw on their face. They want somebody to claim them and be there for them. And so I think this is, this is part of the issue is we've got to train pastors and spiritual leaders and not just, you know, and the people who are out, outside the four walls of the church that probably have the, the background and the education They've, they've probably grown up in the church 30, 40 years. They know all the scriptures and everything like that, but they've never had anybody exciting them to lead, lead them in that direction. Well, I was going to say, it's, it's an interesting discussion because it's kind of uh, people who understand the calling, uh, but are also day-to-day -day in the marketplace. You know, your book, uh, Idle in the Marketplace, is really uh, talking about helping the church find a way to be more effective in reaching people where they are. And then Sam had written a very interesting book called Time to Head for the Ark. And it, it, the, the, the common denominator of this is community. He uses a term in his book called therapeutic community, and it's about all life being lived local. And I want, I want to explore that and then tie that into what you're doing with your facility called the center, mm -hmm. which is not a church. It's a gathering place for people, and he's really talking to people. So, but let me let you explain the concept of therapeutic community. Uh, much of what modern society represents is an extreme statement of a rejection of trying to uh, avoid the curse mm -hmm. uh, of, of, uh, of that uh, mandate to toil the land. But you've got to rebuild, you've got to rebuild a local economy. It's got to be agriculturally based. You've got to focus on all of the physical essentials of life. At the same time, the relational and the spiritual, which, is, which the church uh, majors in. But, but it, to a great extent, doesn't relate it to the, yeah. daily, the daily experience in the marketplace. In particular, Seminary Covenant Community uh, has a lot of very interesting ministries associated that are really touching people in the marketplace. I'm thinking about the flying ministry. You have the, you know, there's so many of them. Yeah, there, we, we have uh, a variety of ministries. It's not specifically geared toward any particular area um, because, as I said in the beginning, it's called to empower people what God's created them to be. So, not everybody's created the same, so therefore all the things are, aren't the same. The, the center is, a, is an old Baptist church, and it had an education building. It hadn't been used for like six years, basically, uh, roof leaked and so on. 
And so we were able to acquire it uh, economically and we started fixing it up. The idea uh, was is that this would be a center where any ministry uh, or any organization that, that needed a place, small or, or large, could come and use the facility to help promote and, and build their ministry. Uh, so right now we have two churches that are using it, very small. One has five, con- five people in the congregation and has a passion to reach out. And uh, we have some educational programs going on there now, and we're looking at actually creating a Bible, Bible university, and uh, we're setting that up. Uh, we have ministries all up and down, like I said, we're worldwide. But here in Brevard County, we have uh, what Terry was referring to as Wings of Grace, which actually takes kids that are ages 14 to 18 and helps them learn how to fly, teaches them everything, and all the way to the point where they get their pilot's license. And what they've done is they've actually went out and bought depressed property, and using the depressed property, the income from the rentals funds the the flight school. And so this is part of what I refer to as social enterprise, where you're actually taking a business model in a nonprofit uh, capacity and fulfilling a social need. And so they have like 20 students a year that go through this flight school and end up with their pilot's license. Uh, and so we're, we're also working with uh, several other organizations. One of the uh, most outstanding organizations that we have has been with us for years called Prison Book Project. And Prison Book Project has, um, they receive Christian books from all the different publishers. They repackage them into boxes and send them into the prisons. Right now, it's 1,874 prisons they're sending books into every every month. And so that's reaching over a million people a month for Christ who are Hmm. in those situations. Um, We've got a a ministry called Marketplace. Um, It's it's called Marketplace. What's the, I'm trying to think of the name of them. Anyway, it's like a flea market. And it's also a thrift store, and they're just opening up. It's called, uh, right now it's called Hometown Marketplace. That's what it is. Hard for me to keep up with everybody's name. So there's many good ideas in the market in the marketplace, and I hope that this is the beginning part of a discussion for us, uh, and that and that we can continue this dialogue because uh, there is so much to be done. And as you guys will both agree, there's there's such an opportunity right now to make these connections. And and our prayer is that E41 Marketplace Fellowship will be a uh, tool to do that. You know, as we close this out. Um, is there any, uh, uh, just a quick final word that, that you'd like to add in on this? Well, Sam mentioned uh, education several times. And we really do need to re-educate both the church leaders and the marketplace leaders on the fundamentals of how God designed us mm-hmm. and the purpose that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I would hope that the pastors that may be watching do not see this as a threat, but simply as an opportunity to leverage what God has given to them. I see, uh, I hear pastors from time to time tell me, well, what you're talking about is marginalizing my ministry. And I say, do you know what margin is anyhow? (laughs) Margin is what you have left over after you sell what you made. What you have left, is pro- that's your margin. And so what I'm talking about is helping you increase your margin by releasing your marketplace ministers into that great mission field of the 21st century called the marketplace. And that's exactly what E41 Marketplace Fellowship is all about. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. I hope you'll come back and uh, we'll continue our dialogue. <laughs>